good morning and good evening beautiful people for another episode of mo's nose glad to see y'all dion you look great as appreciate always it, what a you, great week we just had thank you bro i appreciate it you know glowing glowing something <laughs> like that but uh yeah too it was a great week a lot of stuff to talk about that's for sure uh at least for this podcast later on we're gonna be filling in with james boyd he's a writer for the athletic out in indianapolis he's a guy that asked the question for caitlin clark about how she feels about race and uh misogyny and everything under the sun being associated with her name and uh clearly Cl- clark gave a very pointed answer um and she was very straightforward with the way she wanted to answer that particular question and so why not bring in the guy who asked her the question and that's what this podcast is for and so james boyd will be talking to us later on um and then of course we got to talk about the nba finals boston celtics just beat the dallas mavericks last night uh, they are now 18 time champions for the organization and jason tatum and jalen brown Maybe people will stop talking about them. Who knows? Maybe they're not as corny as everyone says they are. I don't know. I don't know. Well, we'll talk about it later on in the pod. But for right now, though, Dion, man, how has your week been so far? Uh, thank y'all for. Hey, we know we made we we've been gone for the last two weeks. It's been a lot to catch up on. Um, I mean, my weeks have been. It's been up and down. Uh, let's start with first. Uh, right after the last pod we recorded, I went to go see the Wings and Aces, um, and. Watching Asia Wilson in person, I mean, golly, it's, it's beautiful. Uh, from She's beautiful her looks, her both, both, from her looks to her, her her game on the court, I mean, watching it in person, seeing that nobody can guard her, nobody, she can do anything uh, she wanted out there on the court. Granted, my wings are banged up. We are going through, I mean, it's a, it's a tough time right now. I mean, we're missing like four, four, four major uh major and key players right now um so it's tough to watch it's very tough to watch uh but asia was doing whatever she wanted out there and it just made me put in perspective actually watching somebody build their legacy uh from start to finish uh, we're actually watching a goat be created it's dope to to be able to witness that you know um lebron coming into the league i was too young to kind of get the impact of him being in high school and you know that what 2003, 2003 got drafted i was what five six so mm-hmm. i didn't get to really feel that impact of watching a goat like him um uh, you know kobe i saw the you know the middle part to the to the end the finish line but watching her start to finish i'm watching her goat status i mean doing anything she wants on the court she she actually shot a, she, i'm don't think she's a predominant three-point shooter but she shot a three-pointer it looked good all net um and you know watching the game in person is it's crazy that you know without all the gimmicks without all the commercials uh i think she ended up having like a 30 plus point game of course double digit rebounds and it's like dang this is i mean bro first quarter she had they think they had like 21 she had like 15 of their 21 first quarter <laughs> just um, dominating yeah you, you literally can't do anything with it um after that my boy Corey came to Dallas. Uh, we had a, a boys night, crazy that all the boys were here. Uh, had a boys night, that was really good, good, good seeing everybody. Um, and then recently I went to a funeral um, yesterday. Not, you know, funerals are never fun, but celebrating life is, uh, I guess that's the best part about it, celebrating life, celebrating what somebody meant to you. Um, yeah. was a close friend of mine, a mentor. Um, so yeah, uh, it's been an interesting, what, two weeks? Uh, but what about you, brother? Yeah, sorry to hear about your friend passing away. I saw you post about it. I um, want to give you your space for that. But um, yeah, celebrating life is always a good thing. Um, but it sucks when people people go before you think they should. So um, mm-hmm. my week has been okay. Uh, nothing crazy, I guess you could say. Uh, of course, had a couple camps to go to this week. Talked to a couple people. Got to see some old friends, especially from West Texas. Uh, talking out with Roy Williams former um, Texas wide receiver. We got close when I was in Midland because he's from Odessa. And uh, now seeing him out here, how people like love him out here in Austin because you know, he is a Texas legend. And it's like, I know him based off like Odessa. So it was kind of crazy to see uh, the contrast, but yeah, that was cool. Um, Sister came in town this weekend. So we were able to go to a couple spots here in Austin. Bird Bird Biscuit, shout out, phenomenal food. 
first time going over there. And so, yeah, and brought her around the studio. She was just like starstruck about the studio. I was like, bro, it's just a regular new studio. <laughs> crazy. But uh, she's taking pictures and doing all that. Um, got to see me live. So that, that was a cool moment for her um, and for us, you know, um, for my family member to see me do what I do every day. Um, but yeah, really good week. And uh, remember, it's Men's Mental Health Awareness Month. So, uh, you know, everyone go to therapy, go to counseling. Um, we definitely want to talk about it just because we don't, as men, we don't talk about it enough. So uh, definitely get your get your mental state right, because that's a powerful, powerful uh, weapon to have is your mind. Um, and so uh, I, if you don't mind, let's kind of pivot over and talk about some Texas news. Because yeah, stuff that had the TL in a frenzy, I heard. Yeah, people man. not really people not messing with the uh, the way that recruiting is now i mean this is the the evolution of recruiting and uh i mean give us some context of how texas is doing it man oh they're doing well actually yesterday <laughs> um elite 2026 quarterback dia bell and you'll love this dion he's a son of rajah bell um phoenix suns nba star and so uh, he just committed to texas uh and he's a projected five star right now he's on the fringe of four star five star but he'll he'll probably become a five star um out in florida and so uh yeah he's that dude right he's that dude another quarterback commit for steve sarkeesian and uh he, they just have a factory over there now at the quarterback position and that leads me to the conversation of recruitment in general it's coach sark and the talent he's been able to acquire but if you ask the streets it's because of the lambos uh not because of the actual foundation that coach sark has built and you know that's something that we wanted to discuss today on the pod just about this whole Viral tweet, uh, seeing the Lambos lined up during the campus tour or the recruiting tour uh, for the weekend for Texas. Uh, they have a lot of big recruits come in to Austin, come on, uh, come on campus, see what's go- what the program's all about. And uh, they pull out all the stops, right? They put the kids in hotels. Um, they give them all their like favorite snacks or whatever in the hotel rooms and uh, write some little notes, personalized notes for each recruit. Like it's a real big thing, big, big thing, I should say. Um, and as they walk into the facility, Texas, they have a bunch of Lambos laid out right in front of the facility. And um, that got the conversation started around the nation about how, oh, this is how they recruit. They should not have all these cars. If there's if a recruit comes to Austin for a Lambo, that's not the kid I want to be on my team. Whoop, blah, blah, blah. Shut up. Shut up, bro. Because that's not what the recruiting tactic is for Texas. And if you're not here in Austin to know the culture that's being set, to know the foundation that's being laid down, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. And so, yes, the Lambos are a nice touch. And it's what the kids like nowadays. You know, that's the crazy part. Like, they're not just doing it just because they want to show their money. Texas does it because they know this is what the younger younger generation kind of cares about if you go back last season nick saban i don't know if you remember that video dion but nick saban was in his car and kool-aid mckinstry I, I believe that was in the video was behind the camera saying hey rev it up coach like let me what you sipping on you know what i'm saying like you're talking about nick saban yeah. dude yeah. like they love that stuff and so why not bring it out when they're on tour i mean they're on campus touring uh the facility and so yeah that, that's just been my biggest squirrel right now with the whole situation i don't know if that's a word squirrel quarrel quarrel I think quarrel, quarrel, yeah, yeah, quarrel is yeah. word. i said squirrel and quarrel <laughs> <laughs> but that's the biggest quarrel though like right now is that they think everyone outside of austin thinks they're just throwing out nil money to get these recruits and let me tell you this if you just look on the field that's how they're getting recruits if you look at the success that they're having ever since coach Sarver has gotten here year after year more wins each time you see improvement and lastly if you see who's making impacts on the field they're freshmen think about it last year anthony hill jr making his name john tay cook making his name doing his thing malik muhammad doing his thing in the secondary Derek williams a lot of true freshmen got to play last year because they're good not because they're getting paid a bag. And so I think that's the biggest recruiting tool for any of these guys that want to come to Austin is that, no, it's not about the glitz and glamour and the Lambos. They're seeing, if I can play, I'm going to play. And it's not like I got to wait two or three years to get my spot, to get my opportunity. A lot of these positions, they're able to play the moment they step on the 40. 
And so that's the biggest recruiting tool. And not only are they not not only are they getting to play, but also they're getting to play for a team that's competing for a national championship. So it's not like you're a freshman getting to play on a team that's at that's trash, right? Like, you know, I'm about to say, that's yeah, ass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You good? You good? You good, brother? That's ass. Hey, you know what I'm saying? Right here, right here, brother. I got you. You're not playing on a team that's ass. You know, you're playing on a team that's competing for a national championship as a freshman because you're that good, and they're not going to hold you back just because you're an underclassman. Start going to play who's good, and so. If you're good and you're a five star, that's a big draw to want to come to play for Texas. And so, yes, the Lambos are cool. Yes, that's a big conversation. But if you're not on campus, if you're not here covering the team every day, shut up. You don't know what you're talking about. You don't know what you're talking about. You don't know the culture that's here, the foundation that's been set. And so, yeah, that's just a tangent I had to go on before we go to the rest of this podcast. Now you're good. It's frustrating. It's frustrating knowing that you have boots on the ground. And you're watching how this thing's playing out and you're seeing the foundation getting set from year to year. First year being here, not a great year. Moving on to a year with Bijan and Roshan, they do their thing, but they still don't get 10 wins. So what's going on behind the scenes? Well, they're building. They're building. And you see the fruits of it last year going to the Sugar Bowl. And who knows what this year is going to entail their first year in the SEC. They have a really good shot of winning the best conference in the nation. And they have a really good shot of winning the national title. And so clearly, whatever Sark is building is working. That's why recruits want to come to Texas, not because of the Lambos. So you're, so, yeah. you're saying you're saying that the Lambos is more of like the cherry on the top or like the dessert, but yeah, them actually being a good program, that's the entree. That's exactly. that is what got you. Okay, it's kind of okay. like it's, Salt Bay. You know how Salt Bay does. Oh well. yeah, just yeah. You know, here's the Lambo. Well. Yeah, like, if you good, a Lambo. Uh, if you okay. good, the steak yeah. is nice. The steak is phenomenal. You don't need to do the theatrics, but why not? <laughs> you know why not do it? You know why not do the little little drizzle on top? You feel me? So yeah. Do you dude, know I, if do you know if they pull out the Lambos like one certain time, or is this like uh, every time they get a recruit that's coming out they pull out well, the it's a recruiting or... weekend right so you have, oh, okay you have gotcha. a ton of big time recruits on campus so this gotcha. is the one time you can impress a lot of dudes at one time at one time gotcha. and so yeah you want to bring them out for those events for sure and for people who don't like everyone on the twitter is talking about oh, every kid's gonna get a lambo no bro every kid is not getting a lambo if you play for texas like that's not how this works they're just throwing it out there <laughs> like what are what? Like, you that stupid are you that stupid to think that a kid, every recruit, oh, that's why they come to Texas because they're getting a Lambo. <laughs> no, bro. Not everybody gets a Lambo, dude. Shut up. Like, what are we talking about? So, oh, man. yeah. You got to love social media. Bro, man. they don't know what they're talking And that's why I say, if you're not in Austin, shut up. Like, you don't know what you're talking about. Just like the whole Arch Manning situation. Like, everyone outside of Austin was saying, Oh, Arch needs to transfer. Oh, my goodness. Why would he stay behind Quinn? If Quinn stays another year, he's definitely going to leave. Where's Arch Manning right now? He's on the 40. He's complacent. He's chilling. He's having the time of his life, learning how to run this offense behind Quinn Ewers. And he's doing it happily. But everyone outside of Austin is going to tell you he's miserable. He's dreading it. He's so itching to play, which he probably is itching to play, but he also knows the benefits of sitting, the benefits of learning behind the scenes. Um, And that's the problem with this whole Lambo combo. Everyone who's not in Austin Oh my goodness, that's how they recruit? That's how they get all the big time recruits? No, it's because they're winning and because freshmen get to play if they're good. So, yeah, if you're not in Austin, just shut up uh, and follow the people that are and follow the accounts and the reporters that are on the 40 talking to these college athletes every single day, co- talking to these coaches every single day. That's what you should be doing, getting your opinion based off that and not based off a random Twitter video. So, thanks. Um, thanks. Yeah, if every freshman is getting Lambos, I will reclassify. <laughs> y'all will see me. Uh, y'all will see me. I'll go to some of them uh, Netflix high school and reclassify. They reclassify. stop it, bro. <laughs> Netflix, Netflix high school. Sick of, what is it? Sick of more, yeah, B, yeah, BS High. Yeah, I, yeah. Y'all, y'all see me at BS High. Everybody's getting a Lambo. Yeah, so. go ahead and give me some NIL money. <laughs> 
Well, look, um, man, let's let's keep it going. Let's talk about some hoops, man. Let's throw it to uh, let's throw, let's talk to the WNBA before we talk about the finals. Yeah, man, so, I'm excited. I'm excited for this conversation because it's it's a guy that I respect highly because it takes a lot of balls to ask questions about racism, to ask questions about um, misogyny and and just flat out discrimination, right? Um, but then to do it with the biggest superstar on the court right now, men or women, and Kaylin Clark. I think that took a lot of guts um, from my guy, James Boyd. And so that's why I reached out to ask him to hop on the pod. And um, he writes for The Athletic. He also writes about the Colts and the Pacers and all things Indianapolis. So not just the fever, but he's been there since day one. Since the moment Caitlin Clark had her first initial press conference after getting drafted by the Indiana Fever, he was there. And so this is James Boyd. I uh, hope you all enjoyed the conversation because he gave a lot of insight about what's happening in that locker room. And stop listening to the national media because the local guys are the ones that know the true story and this is why i'm this is why we're giving it to you today so here's our conversation with james boyd all right everybody my guy is now joining us james boyd the writer for the athletic uh, the writer in Indianapolis, I should say. He's a guy. He's a guy you should be following. He's a guy you should be paying attention to. Because he's talking all things Indianapolis Colts. He's talking all things Indiana Pacers. And most recently and most notably, I should say, nowadays, he's talking about all things Indiana Fever with Caitlin Clark. And my boy said he's on vacation right now. So first off, thank you for <laughs> spending time with me on your vacation. Second off, I know you needed it after the week like you just had. Yeah, I've seen an eventful week. Um, it was pre-planned. You know, I try to tell people, like, you don't run from smoke if you, uh, you know, end a little <laughs> bit. But obviously, that is kind of like my side hustle. My main gig is the Colts. But obviously, with Caitlin being here, with the Pacers making the East Conference Finals, you kind of just chip in where you can and you try to provide coverage, you know, to the city. So I'm enjoying it. You reached out. You all reached out. I'm like, it's all love. You know, it's not a big deal. And obviously, you know, a little podcast ain't nothing when you got the rest of the day off. So I'm good. <laughs> right, right, love, right, that. Right. love that. Love that. All right, let's get into the juicy stuff. (laughs) (laughs) Well, like you mentioned, James, we reached out just because I know you got boots on the ground, you know, and that's something that our show takes pride in is not talking about things that we're not at. You know, we're not in those locker rooms. And so if I have the network to ask somebody that's there, why not? And so that's why we wanted to ask you about this whole past week. Just first off, how has it been with all the national coverage uh, surrounding Caitlin Clark? And um, you've been in the middle of, a lot of it because of the tweet that you had and the question that you asked her. And so uh, what has this last week been? It's been crazy. Um, Probably nothing I've ever experienced in my media life. I've been doing this six years now since college. And um, I knew Kayla Clark would be a huge deal because she is one of the biggest names, players in the world right now today. But I didn't know if I anticipated how much she would get tugged or her name rather would get tugged in so many different directions. Um, you know, and I think the biggest thing you have to remember, at least covering her, in my opinion, is like what she said and done. And that kind of keeps me centered with a lot of the nonsense that kind of um, gets pulled out of whatever she does. Um, she's always been pretty much a consummate professional. Um, I think that she has a ton of pressure on her, a ton of weight on her, a ton of attention. Um, I don't I don't envy that at all. Everything she does, everything she says is a story, quite frankly. Um, I'm not going to shy away from the fact that I'm part of that, you know, covering her. But as far as, you know, being involved and being in the mix and kind of having some some videos and things go, you know, this way, that way. I thought that the other day when she was asked, you know, by my colleague Jim Trotter about, you know, culture wars and things like that. I don't know if that was as direct if it, as it needed to be, you know what I'm saying? And mm-hmm. so, I just felt like before people try to, you know, take this and say, oh, this young woman feels this way or that way. I felt like, hey, I'm a journalist. I'm there. Boots on the ground, as you say. Just ask her directly. How do you feel about this, this and this racism, misogyny and whatever else? And obviously she denounced it. But the hard part then, at least for her, in my opinion, because all she said she wants to do is play basketball. I understand that. But in the first moment, first interaction, when she kind of dismissed Jim's questions, and again, were they the most like forthright questions? Maybe not. Um, but I try to at least give a bit of grace. And I know people are like, well, you know, 
Some people never get that kind of grace. Look, man, um, the way I was raised, you try to give it to everybody, no matter what they look like, you know, what privilege they might have. And so I thought that, hey, before anybody tries to write anything, say anything, do anything um, about this young woman, especially when you're trying to say she believes this and it's a serious allegation, just ask her straight up. And then that, I think she got it, obviously, the second time. She said what she said. Um, she said, don't use my name for certain agendas. You know, everyone should be treated equally and fairly. And then as we'll get into, it's not good enough for anybody. It seems like, you know, some people accepted it. Some people didn't. And I think that just goes to show how much, um, again, I try to center her at this at the center of my coverage and what I do, because I know um, from covering her, she's never really said or done anything that's just so egregious or foul that would make me question her character. And I felt like <coughs> important, important in that moment to just let people know, hey, this is how she feels. This is what she said. You know, take it or leave it. And James, really quick, uh, just to clear up the timeline, was that all the same day or? Yeah, you know, oh yeah. That, the first yeah, question but, and then DJ Nate, she yeah, sent her so, tweet. Exactly, so let me break down. That's a great question, Dion. I'm glad you asked this. So let's go back. She said what she said to Jim Trotter's questions at shoot around. So this probably was at maybe like 11 a.m., you know, around noon maybe. So this is about seven hours, eight hours before the game starts. Mm -hmm. And then when we get to you know, that gets clipped and put online, obviously by me. And I'm seeing the conversation like shift from, oh, she's not an ally. She's not this, she's not that. And again, I don't know Caitlyn personally. I don't really know too many people in the media who do because she has so much attention. It's, it's just different with her. I feel like I have a closer bond or relationship with Tyrese Halliburton, who's also an all-star, you know, all NBA player, you know, really good player than her because of her, just how much attention she brings to the game and around her. But obviously, you know, she says what she says. It goes viral. And I'm like, man, this is a, you know, interesting conversation um, that's getting sparked up. And then you see what DJ Nate Carrington says. And this is where I, the journalist, felt like, because I've, I've struggled with this with Caitlyn. I see the stuff that's being said and people who pretend to be her fans and use racist or misogynistic stuff to try to attack other players in the league or players on her team. Like, I see the stuff. But... I was 50 50 on even asking her about it because in my mind, I'm like, I can't ask. I would never ask a player what Twitter is saying because Twitter is always saying crazy foul stuff. But when a player, you know, brings this up and says, Hey, you know, this is your an opportunity for you to denounce some of this stuff that's going on. We, I feel like you didn't do this. Then to me, it adds a little more like, okay, if a peer is critiquing you in this manner or critiquing, you know, your fan base. And again, I say fan base as in pretending to be her fans. I think real Caitlin Clark fans aren't those types of people. Then I felt like at that point, it's valid enough for me to ask you directly about this, this, and this. This player said this, how she feels. And then the timeline. So again, she said all this stuff initially. It's not something I can control. So, um, you know, I don't put too much thought and time into thinking about things like that and to be honest I don't see a lot of it um like I've said like basketball is my job like everything on the outside I can't control that so I'm not going to spend time thinking about that um you know people can talk about what they want to talk about um create conversations about you know whatever it is but I think for myself like you know I'm just here to play basketball I'm here to have fun um I'm trying to help our team win obviously we've we've won three games and you know we feel like we've been in a position to win a few more than that and um you know, my focus is on helping us do that, but um, I don't, you know, pay much mind to all of that, to be honest. You know, kind of vaguely, hey, I just want to play basketball. I don't get into this. I don't hear anything. That was that shoot around. We get back to pregame, and then D I see the DJ Nate Carrington tweet probably like right after we had done some pregame media with the Fever head coach. And so at this point, Caitlin's warming up on the court, and she's not like set up to be interviewed. Like it wasn't like everyone knew she was going to talk. Yeah. I went over to, you know, F Fever PR, and I'm like, hey, is Kaylin going to talk, you know, pregame? And he's like, you know, they're like, hey, if you if you want her, we can get her. And so it wasn't like I even gave PR a heads up what I was going to ask. I wasn't going to ask, you know, Caitlin a leading question like, hey, I know you're not this. Can you just say this? I just asked her point blank, like on the record. And I didn't, you know, bring up DJ Nick Carrington in the question. But in my mind, I'm like, this is valid now. And I don't even know if Caitlin had a chance to see that tweet. Um, yeah, because it happened, say, I want to say, right before the game. And so she's warming up. Uh, yeah, go ahead, I'm quick, sorry. Quick tad note. Um, for anyone who's, you know, not journalist, right, that's listening to the pod, that is a battle in your mind. Like, trying to figure out, should I bring up the tweet in the question? 
Should I not bring up the tweet? So what led you to yeah. not bring up the tweet in your question? I felt like if I bring up that tweet in the direct question, then I'm like throwing Dijanae out there mm. and like hiding behind her in a way. I felt like if I'm going to ask this question, I need to just stand on my own principles, my own morals and my own journalistic you know, integrity and take whatever, you know, comes with it. And I felt like, you know, I alluded to it in my tweet after with the video, but I'm like, in the moment, I'm not about to ask you like, oh, this player said this about your fan base. I'm just saying, hey, let's get this on the record. And, and really, I'm thinking this is an opportunity for you to maybe realize that, you know, everything when you get asked certain things and then in my case, directly certain things, there is no way for you to kind of keep it basketball because, you know, the first time around you can say, you know, culture wars or whatever, it might have been implied or whatever. But I think when you're talking about race, um, any of the isms, as I say, you know, racism, sexism, misogyny, um, anything of that nature, you have to just be direct. I think we expect that of anybody in journalism. And so I feel like I, I can personally ask a better question, be a better journalist. And so I did. And, you know, we asked the question. Hey, I know you mentioned that, you know, you want to focus straight on basketball. You definitely respect that. But when just asking you directly, when people use your name for racism, misogyny, whatever, yeah. what is your response to that specifically? Yeah, I think it's disappointing. I think, um, you know, everybody in our world, you know, deserves the same amount of respect. The, the women in our league deserve the same amount of respect. So um, I, people should not be using my name to push those agendas. Um, it's disappointing. Um, you know, it's, it's not acceptable. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, this league is a league I grew up admiring and wanting to be a part of. Like, some of the women in this league were my biggest idols and role models growing up and helped me want to achieve this moment right here that I get to play in every single night. So, um, just treating every single woman in this league with the same amount of respect, I think it's just a basic human thing that everybody should do. Like, you know, just be a kind person and treat them, you know, how you would want to be treated. And um, I think it's, you know, very simple. She gives the answer and then whatever happens after that, I'm thinking that's up to you all. But again, I felt like this is an opportunity for, you know, you to stand on this. Now, if you come out and we ask you directly about this, this, and this, and you say, I just want to see the basketball, then people can, you know, yeah. make whatever conclusions they want. <clears throat> but again, she came out and again, this was not, to me at least, scripted or it wasn't like she had this prepared statement. She wasn't even supposed to talk. She wasn't going to talk yeah. until we went and got her again pregame. And then obviously she said what she said and everyone else in the world said a lot too. But um, again, <laughs> I think that Caitlin handled the situation, maybe not perfectly, but she handled it pretty well the second time around. And again, she's 22. So how many people in your life, you know, have done everything right at 22? I like that, Jam. Thank you, first off, for giving us that timeline. Great question, Dion. And uh, <clears throat> the reason why I say that is because from the outside looking in, I kind of thought the same things you mentioned throughout this timeline. Like Jim Trotter asked a question. She didn't really answer it. And then next thing we know, DJN makes a tweet. And the next thing I know, there's another quote from Caitlin later in the day saying, no, I do dismiss, dismiss all that stuff. And to me, I thought, oh, yeah, they definitely made her say something. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> after that first interaction with Jim Trotter, they saw the backlash on Twitter and made her say something. But thank you, James, for giving us that inside yeah. look and letting us know, Just, no, she wasn't supposed to talk. Yeah, real away. quick. I actually clipped that, you know, from the entire scrum. And she probably talked for like seven minutes pregame. That wasn't the first question. It was about, you know, preparing for the mm -hmm. game against the Atlanta Dream. You know, how does your offense get better? And I was thinking, you know, heart beating out of my chest. Like, let me just ask you the question that, that probably needs to be asked more than anything else that's going on right now. So we can, again, nip this in the bud. Because I even saw, you know, certain media members who were drawing their own conclusions. And you're fair to do that. But saying, oh, man, this was a huge missed opportunity you know she wasn't being an ally she wasn't doing this and i'm like but do we know this for sure mm -hmm. and again you can draw whatever conclusions you want from people's words and actions and other things but that's where i'm like i've never seen caitlin do anything you know to be uh someone that pushes or excludes other people or you know minorities in any sense i've never really seen her do that ever and then i'm like okay well let's just get her or at least talk to her and see what she says about it as well now, if you say something, do something different, then that's a whole, you know, well, we're saying this and you ain't really, you know, acting on what you say. But I thought, you know, for the most part, she answered, you know, how she's also acted because um, she didn't ask for any of this. And, and I actually asked her that one of her first interviews here in Indianapolis, like, when did you 
you know, sort of accept or when did you realize like, you know, it's not just basketball anymore. And, you know, obviously she wants to keep it that, but when you're a star as big as her, when you're in a league that is the WNBA, you can't always default to, you know, I just, I'm just here to play basketball. Like, and, and then people kind of fault her for that. I think that it's easier to be like that when you're getting asked a million questions every single day from yeah. every single news outlet in the world. But there's obviously certain instances where you might learn, I think she'll learn from this, where you can't default to that kind of like on autopilot. You probably need to have a little bit more. But yeah, that question was in the middle of a scrum. Um, it wasn't the first question, it wasn't the last question. It was like, you know, maybe a couple minutes in, and it's like, oh, hey, can you answer this? And she took it straight in stride and answered it very well, in my opinion. All right. Well, uh, I know we wanted to talk a little bit about basketball, about the team in general. I just had one last question this in this topic, and it would be, you know, Something that I've realized here in Austin is that, you know, this video of like the Lambos went viral recently and the whole recruiting trip. And, you know, everyone's putting their two cents in that doesn't live in Austin, that doesn't cover the Longhorns. And they have no idea what the hell they're talking about. And so, you know, as you know, when you're in the city, when you're covering the team, the outside narrative is completely different than what's actually happening in the building. And so from your perspective, what is something that you feel like there's a narrative around Caitlin that just isn't true with what you've been seeing, what you've been watching since you're you're the one covering her on a daily basis. Yeah, I think probably the biggest one is that she wants to be coddled. Mm. And I think that comes from a lot of people trying to latch onto her name because she gives a lot of the, like if you're playing 2K, she gives like the best answer in like your my career or something like that. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, she yeah. gives, you know, very routine answers, but I think that she is this fiery, like, bring it at me player. Um, and I think she has sort of like that killer's mentality where, and again, it might not always look great because, I, you know, I'm not one of those people who's going to say she was an Olympic team snub. She was not snub. You know, there are <laughs> women in the world who are better basketball players right now and yeah. deserve to be on that team. You know what I'm saying? And so, exactly. Just straight basketball wise, there are better players. But I think that as a competitor, when she says, you know, or tells her coach, Chrissy Sides let us in and was like, hey, you know, they woke up a monster. That's Caitlyn. That's the real Caitlyn. Like, you know, not the one that, you know, gives us all these cookie cutter answers. I think that she is a fiery trash talker. I think that she is someone who, you know, wants smoke. I think that she doesn't duck or run from much of it. And obviously there's going to be a lot of things that, um, you know, happen whenever she gets fouled or hits the floor, but she didn't ask for that. And so that's what I kind of remind myself of what I've been telling you all is that whenever I really started covering Caitlyn since she got here, after the draft, she has never asked to be baby. She's never asked to be handed everything. Um, yes, there's been times where she's complained about officiating or being hammered or whatever. And you might feel, dang, she's a little bit entitled or whatever. But I think that she's also knowing that, you know, I'm going to get every team's best shot because I was the number one pick. I'm bringing all this attention to the league. It's not all because of her, but it, there is a big, you know, reason why every game is sold out. It is Caitlin Clark. And so um, I just enjoy the fact that she wants to smoke, I believe. And then she can say a lot of things, but when you see her play, her demeanor, and then just the perfectionist in her, um, I think she has just this, this will to win. And then I don't think that she's all that nice either. And I think that's a different conversation for women in sports and things like that, where it's like, oh, she isn't exactly as nice and dainty and um, polite as people would like, like, nah. She get out there. She probably says some words you can't repeat to your mama. And that's fine. I mean, we all do it when we go hoop. So um, I enjoy seeing her play, man. And I think that she, again, she's handled this um, fairly well, considering just how many different directions she's trying to get pulled in. I like that. I like that a lot. And, and it's, you know, Dion had a question just about the team. But I, I you mentioned how she, she gives you cookie cutter answers at the podium, even though she has that quote unquote monster inside of her and um, the fiery side of her. It's, it's weird to me, though, and this isn't a question. This is just a thought right now. Just in the WNBA, <clears throat> a lot of the stars aren't that afraid to speak their mind. Like a Diana Taurasi, right? She's going to give you it mm -hmm. the way she's thinking it. So, you know, it's it's weird to see how Caitlin maybe is taking that different approach. And it's like, I'm going to watch every word I say, despite the culture of the league not being that, that way. So, um, yeah, maybe, maybe that starts point. to turn a little bit once she gets more comfortable and the national media stops getting her eyes off of her and she could become more like Caitlyn um, in front of the press or, or press conference and stuff like that. So that's interesting. Just interesting real quick, that that. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll throw this in there. Um, it's funny you say that, but I think certain players, I see Luca the same way. 
Like Thanks. Luca is yeah. a killer. But every time he's in a press conference, he gives the most boring and regular answers ever. <laughs> you know, I remember after True. he hit the game winner over Rudy Gobert, someone asked him, oh, he can't guard you. And he says, like, oh, I was speaking Slovenian. Or someone asked him about, a, you know, having a 30-point triple-double with 15 rebounds. And he's just like, oh, it was my teammates and things like that. Some people just give that default. And I think it's on us as reporters. And, again, being around them every day yeah. or every few days, you get to kind of paint the real picture of, like, okay, Here's little tidbits here and there of what I've seen from the team. Because I got a pair of binoculars that I bring to every game. And so I'm looking at the bench like, okay, how are you really interacting with your teammates, with your coaches, with the officials, and things like that? And you see little nuggets here and there, and you're like, okay, maybe you aren't as nice and buttoned up as you appear to be. And then for her, I think that it's just easier. I don't want to say it's better, but it's easier for her brand if she is, you know, a person that always takes the high road, always gives the easy answers, always gives the cookie cutter answers, because that keeps everybody happy, especially when you're trying to monetize your fame. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Thanks. Yeah, D. Uh, James, uh, I really got two questions, and then you know, I'm, I'm, I'm you, you kind of hit everything on the head. Um, I, how, how long do you think this takes this, uh, this team to really become competitive? I mean, I, I, they got some good building block pieces. Um, I mean, this season's been kind of rough, but I've seen them have glimpses of uh, that they're making strides in the right direction. How, how long do you think it takes? Man, that's a great question, right? It's a basketball question. <laughs> but I think that um, it'll take – I think they'll look better now because they had a crazy schedule to start the year. I believe it was like 11 games in 19 or 20 days. Mm-hmm. Um, the last time we saw that was over, you know, I believe like 15 years ago, you know, with a team starting with that many games in that few days. And now they got, you know, a bit of a breaks in between games. And they're also not playing the very best teams in the league. You know, when you got – games against the the sun um you're, you're seeing the storm again you're seeing the aces it's like dang can we get anybody that's not you know one of those teams that's gonna be there at the end you know what i'm saying and so i think that the break now you know in between games they got the washington Mystics coming up i believe tomorrow and some other like kind of mid-tier teams i think we'll see some better play but what's really encouraging from their win against the sky this past sunday on father's day was how good Aaliyah boston and Kaitlyn clark looked together that was the first game where they both had a great game in the same game. And that's been a lot of competition around the team is like, man, if you run the offense, you know, through Caitlin, how does it look for Aaliyah? You know, and because last year everything went through Aaliyah. And, and there were times where I'm like, dang, like we thought, you know, back to back number one picks, they get it right away. But it's taking a little bit longer. And I think that, you know, because of that, you know, conversations have kind of, you know, jumped up. Like, can they play together? It's been 15 games, you know, if you pipe down a little bit, they're going to be here for a long time. You know, the franchise is happy to have both of them. But I do think that what we saw against the sky with a lot of the two man action, Caitlin moving the ball and really playing inside out because, it, you know, there were some games this year where they were trying to like run it all through Caitlin. And I'm like, man, your strength and your bread and butter probably is still, you know, making sure that Leah touches that ball and she's involved in some actions, too. And, um, you know, not like I'm some basketball expert. Looking at them run the two-man game, I'm like, hey, when you run out of options and you're late in the shot clock, just run that pick and roll with those two because you're probably going to get a good look either for one of them or somebody else who, um, you know, gets some open look because they drew so much attention. So I'm excited to see them grow together. I think they're moving in the right direction. But like I said, the schedule, being able to practice, and then being able to gel a little bit more has helped a ton because if you think about it, man, I believe their first, like, game of the regular season was maybe like a month to the day of Caitlin playing a national championship game or something like that. So it wasn't that much time, you know, right. to really prepare. To fix and that, so, bro. like I said, <laughs> it's different. It's hard for every, yeah. you know, college player. It wasn't just Caitlin, but it's certainly the transition they have to make. And I think they've done a, you know, solid job so far. And they, they picked it up as of late. They won three or four, two in a row. And that, that's obviously important for this team. And last question, James. I just want to know, like, how has, because uh, I truly believe that no matter what schooling, uh, you went to, Corey went to that. There's nothing that can compare or prepare you for a star like Caitlin Clark and everything that came with it. So how has it kind of been, I guess, changing your mindset or just growing throughout this time of, you know, having to learn how to ask a direct question like that to, <laughs> you know, get get an answer like, hey, you probably want to answer this question. So just in case, you know, if you don't know, you say you, since you don't check social media, they're killing you in the back end. Uh, so how is that kind of like, you know? Being- yeah, that's a great question. I think, and Corey can speak to this, when you're in media, it's a two-way street, right? So if I want you to give these, you know, 
quote unquote better answers, I have to ask you the best question possible. And if I feel like I didn't do my part in that, then I feel like it would be disingenuous of me to just take whatever you know answer you gave the first time, even though it was a valid question, and run with it rather than like, okay, let's just put it plainly in front of you. That way, no one can be confused. No one can like, you know, skirt out the back door. Or even in this position, you ask a coach about something involving the starting lineup, but it's not, you know, as clear as you want it to be. They might, you know, try to defer or wiggle out of it. It's like, nah, well, let's bring it straight here. And so it's really taught me that you never stop learning how to get better at this as a journalist. You never stop learning how to be better at asking questions, be better in moments, you know, with massive attention like what it is with Caitlin. And then also on a personal level, it's just remembering like, them folks on Twitter don't know you, you know what I'm saying? And so that's what I really had to challenge myself personally on is like, man, you try to build your reputation a certain way. You try to portray yourself and your, your character, your integrity a certain way. But with her, you might tweet something and it goes everywhere. And you have people who have never met you a day in their life, never read a story from you, never saw an interview from you. And they're telling you who you are when they don't know you. Yeah. And so that's a, that can be frustrating at times, but it's like, you know, people are like, oh, you set her up or, you know, you didn't set her up. And I think what's funny is, and I guess it's a sign of perhaps trying to do the job the right way. You have people, you know, who are saying, Caitlin can do nothing right, you know, screaming at you. And then you got people who are saying, Caitlin can do nothing wrong, screaming at you as well. And it's like, most of the time, it's probably somewhere in the middle. Like, is she this perfect basketball savant, you know, or savant who should have everything handed to her? No. Like, you know, are there times where you can look at her body language? Is not that great on the court? Yes. You know, is everything, you know, her fault? No. Is everything her teammates fault or coach's fault? No. And so that's the hard part about being in this media space, especially now, because everyone wants to give like a hot take or like something that's going to get you to, you know, side one way or the other, but it's just not like that. And so I've learned a lot throughout this process. I'll learn more. And um, again, I just feel like if I'm learning this, um, imagine what Caitlin is learning about just what her spotlight and fame means. And again, I'm one, I'm of the, the, the notion that every athlete doesn't have to speak on everything you know what i'm saying like if you do that i you know i commend you if you don't i'm not gonna like you know say you're a bad person or you know do the reverse of that and say oh my gosh I can't believe you didn't speak up it's just that you know in certain situations like we talked about you have to say something you know what i'm saying you can't you know say i'm gonna play basketball for every answer there are certain answers you have to give and she's learning that i'm learning that and um you know the joy of it is that you know after that little whirlwind for the last couple of days they got back to basketball they play pretty good, and you know, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of conversations about her going forward because that's just what, who, and, and, and what she is at this point. But again, remember what Caitlin's been saying. Remember what she's been doing. Um, she's been doing a fine job, and again, I, I can't be too upset about anything she's done, and that kind of keeps me grounded throughout this whole process. But I'd be lying if I said it was like normal. Um, you know, I just never imagined that everyone would have an opinion, or you would be the, at the epicenter of everything you know involving one of the biggest stars in the world right now so um learning process learning curve all those things but hey i'm built for it <laughs> hey he's like built that he's I'm like that bro <laughs> he's like that uh i just have one final question too james because you mentioned that being at the epicenter of everything that's going on that also means people are going to be taking your content without asking so i just wanted to bring up the whole rg3 situation uh why do you feel the need to call him out for stealing your video yeah um, so yeah <laughs> that's a great question I think about what I'm going to say I think, that, <laughs> I think that there are times when people will like take your video right and it's a blogger or it's a fan or whatever and I'm not going to you know jump on Twitter and ask for every single video to be taken down and people are like just watermark it I'm like man that's a, that's a whole process yeah. and then you got to take the video put it through an app re-download re it that takes time and it takes you know a memory on your phone and I'm like and then uh, I look at it like this. I'm not monetizing this stuff. And I have no, you know, no, um, nothing against people who pay for Twitter. Like, I think that if you can monetize your, your thing, that's cool. I just think for me, I don't ever want to be like, man, am I chasing clicks or am I, if I'm, if I'm, or am I just doing my job? Like, that's the hard part. And I, that's a personal thing where I'm like, I don't know if I can, you know, stay as rigid as I've been if I try to float into those waters and nothing against that at all. But all of that to say when I see someone like RG3 who, you know, claims to be a media member, rip the video, not ask, you know, any other questions, not add any other commentary, but really to me, it looked like you saw a viral moment. <laughs> and reposted I'm gonna, it. I'm gonna take this video, <laughs> I'm gonna repost it, and I'm gonna get, you know, 
engagement, oh. which leads to, you know, clicks and money. Yeah. Really, I'm thinking, so you're taking money from this very serious conversation we had. You stole the video. You did nothing to, you know, add to it. I could see if you took it and you were like, hey, here's my commentary. I threw it in my YouTube channel. Here's what I have to say about this. You just saw it and basically said what I already said. And I'm like, what is so hard about quote tweeting it? What is so hard about retweeting it? Or if, you just, if you're just going to do that. Yeah, that and again, I'm not getting paid off of it. I'm not getting any monetary money from it. And so I'm not going to fight every blogger. Um, you know, we have cold people that might take a video here and there. And it's like, man, you, you shouldn't do that. But I'm like, you, if you want to be in this space, you should probably know the rules to this. Like every, you know, just real quick for the listeners, every platform that you saw the video on of her talking at the shoot around or a pregame, they ask for that. They can't just take that. So when ESPN, I work for The Athletic, when ESPN wants that video, they have to ask for it. They just can't take it and throw it on TV. Same with CBS, same with Yahoo, every outlet that reached out. And so when I see him just take the video, a day later, just for engagement, I'm yeah, like, what are you doing, bro? And then <laughs> what bothered me the most about it is I'm like, you already have made, you know, a lot of money in your lifetime. You probably made more money in your lifetime than a lot of you are ever going to see. And then you already have 2.2 million followers. You already, you know, have, have made money. So I'm thinking you're just, in my opinion, and I said it and I'll stand on it. I'm like, this to me looks like grifting. Mm. Like you're putting this out there to say, oh my gosh, this conversation, oh, you know, look how bad it is. This is crazy, out of control, but really, you're only doing you could have said all of that you know by quote tweeting the video yeah. you're doing all of that to get you know gain or monetary you know value from it and i just didn't respect that i never will and i felt like again someone of your status with your level of fame who wants to be in media who is in media to do that bro like that's weak and then you know to not even respond to me or anybody else that's fine and and i, I gotta have conversations about this Privately, people are like, man, like, why do you engage? And I don't jump down everybody's throat. You know, that, that'll take me all day. I just felt like every now and then we need to be told what we look like. Mm. That way, again, yeah. if you have an opportunity to tell me otherwise or explain yourself, then do that. But if you don't, then it is what it is. So I had to be direct with that. I was, uh, you know, maybe a little too much on Twitter that day. But I, I kind of stand by what I said because we. it wasn't even the last thing I'll say about it. It's not necessarily the video and i've had this conversation with people all the time like it's not this 30 second video it's not this minute long video it's everything you had to do to get there to take the video mm -hmm. you see what i'm saying Corey? Yeah. like the grind you had to go through like not saying i'm some you know hero but there's things that i had to do in my career you know starting off doing high school sports and grinding when nobody you know was there and i was the only reporter now it seems like you know everything you do with caitlin there's 10 or 12 people there you know with a mic in her face you wouldn't do half the stuff that I did to get here to even take this video. And now you want to skip steps and just rip it for your own game. And I'm like, that's not cool, bro. Like people put in years and years and years to have these opportunities to tell these stories, to, you know, stand there and have the right to take that video. And then you just step over all my hard work and take it. And then again, it's not even like it's a highlight video. It's a very serious conversation that I think that you're just taking to gain, you know, money from. And I'm like, dude, you got money already. Like, what are we doing? So, um, you know, I think that that's learning, you know, experience for everybody involved. And, um, you know, I don't plan on clapping back at everybody again or keeping this on going or having some beef. I just felt like, you know, again, it's an opportunity to be real and be direct. And I was. Thank you for saying that, James, because a lot of people don't understand that about our business. It's like, no, nah, we don't just get a credential whenever we want to. Like we had to work to get to this spot. And even for your situation, you've been at every practice, every game. Like Caitlin knows your face. So that's also, I feel like a part of the situation where it's like, she may not answer that question the way she did with somebody else because you've been putting in the work to being at all of those events that no one's at, right? Um, and so she's- Yeah, that's the funny part yeah, about it. Yeah, like she knows your <laughs> People face. are like, man, like she doesn't like you or man, she like, next time you <laughs> see her, it's gonna be this and that. And I'm like, that's what you think mm -hmm. through your Twitter screen, you know, with this fake profile picture. I see her the next day and it's nothing. And I think that she's handled a lot of this very well and she's been a professional throughout all of it. Now, again, I don't know how she personally feels about me. Like, I don't talk to Caitlyn like off the record. Um, there hasn't been any one-on-one -on -one opportunities with her. But I think, again, as you know, being in media, if you write something, if you say something, yeah. if you ask a question that sparks all this stuff and you show up the next yeah. day, I think that kind of shows your character mm -hmm. more than anything. Like, it's different if you come and you, uh, you see something trending on Twitter, I'm gonna write this story about whatever somebody asked her, and you put your headline on, you put your byline on it, and you get a bunch of clicks, that's cool. 
but you also don't have to be here every day. And I think that that's where, why I wanted to ask her the question directly because I'm thinking, hey, I've never seen this stuff. I don't know what I believe. So let's just tell or ask you to put it on the record and then people can take whatever they want from it. And they did. And um, again, I think that she gave an appropriate answer. But yeah, it's funny hearing all the conversations about, oh my gosh, you're never going to get access to her again. The credentials <laughs> should be revoked and all of that. And I'm like, nah, I'll be there tomorrow. So yeah, bro, it's all like, good. Shut up, bro. <laughs> shut up. The Twitter figures away. <laughs> Well, thank you so oh, much, man. James, bro, for joining us. Um, I I know the other quick note, Austin. You know, we got to ask about Adonai Mitchell. How's he doing? How's he looking? Um, a lot, a lot of good things I've been hearing so far at Coach Camp. Man, I'm trying not to be like hyperbolic, but he has been really good throughout spring practice. Like, if I had to pick a standout player, I had to do it actually for a piece in the Athletic, and I said he was a standout player from the spring. You know, I'm not saying he was the best player, but if you're looking for you know, noteworthy plays. I believe we saw about six or seven like open practices between OTAs, veteran minicamp, even rookie minicamp. Um, Might have been about seven to ten, and he had a notable catch in every single day that we were out there. Um, there were a couple of plays where he connected with Anthony Richardson, and you know, it's Anthony scrambling. They had a seven on seven drill one one day where Anthony rolled out to his right, kind of scrambled a little bit, found AD Mitchell in the back of the end zone, and dude just climbs the ladder. Snatches it out the air, toe taps his feet like, you know, Chad Ochocinco. And I'm like, that's nice. Like, that's important. That might be helpful. Neat. And um, I think that he's uh, he's been a lot of fun to cover, too. He was mad that night where he kind of had to wait to get drafted. And everyone was like, man, is his attitude okay? And he's been smiling ever since he got here and making plays. And I think that the Colts are excited. And I think there's a real chance that he could compete alongside Alec Pierce um, to take over potentially, you know, Pierce's spot as the number three receiver in that deep threat in the offense. So um, it's early, but all the signs are pointing to this guy being a really good player and being an um, explosive player at that. Like everything that Shane Steichen says about him and just to fill everybody in, Shane is a man of very few words. He's kind of like Belichick where he doesn't give you a whole lot. And so when he says a player is doing X, Y, Z well, or if he separates great at the top of his route, like he said about A.D. Mitchell, He's not just saying this to give us clicks or just saying something that he doesn't mean. Like, when that man gives a compliment, he really means it. And so he, he's been pointing out that AD can get open. And that's the biggest thing, obviously, as a receiver. If you get open, he catch the ball, and he's done that pretty well so far with the Colts. Great to hear that, bro. Great to hear that. He's just he's a great young man. That, that's why I didn't feel like the rumors before the draft, where'd they come from? Like, it just made no sense to me. But, you know, it sucks that he slid down to the spot. That Again, you on the ground, though, yeah, right? Fact, you fact. on the ground. Like, I'm, on the, I'm here. I'm so, talking to the guy, bro. Different. He moved to Austin for his family, for his daughter. So it's like, what are we talking about, dude? Um, but, you know, man, rumors, NFL, it's a, it's a, it's a snaky business, I guess you should say. <laughs> sometimes, business. sometimes, yeah. But yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you so much, James, for getting us all the details. I would ask you about an Alyssa and DJ D- Carrington situation, but... I don't know if you that plugged in. Ooh, yeah, huh. like that. Nah, I'm good on that. I'm good on that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good on that. What I will say though, is the, the, like they both been hooping. Yeah, they have been hooping. Both been hooping for sure. Corey is a clown. <laughs> Man, I first time talking to James in an extended amount of time, and that was awesome. Like the way he felt like we knew the guy, bro. Facts, like. I just love the way how he's so passionate about what he does and you could see it by the work that he puts in. And it's so cool that a guy like that was getting a lot of recognition for the way he handled that situation. Um, because like I said, bro, the timeline wasn't adding up to me. I had a couple questions about that, right? Like Same here. Jim Trotter asks a question. She doesn't really acknowledge it. Dijanae Carrington comes out, makes the tweet. Then Caitlin's new response is a lot different than her first response. So I'm thinking the team told her to say something like you're getting blasted on social media, but it's not the case. James said he went up, asked for her. She wasn't supposed to talk. He got her to talk anyways, and then just straight up asked her the question. So she, she hadn't had anything planned. It wasn't premeditated. So uh, shout out to James for putting in that work and, and being a real journalist. And that's why we should follow the people that are in the city, in those locker rooms and not just national pundits. Yeah, it opened my eyes to that uh, y'all's <laughs> y'all's profession isn't the uh, two behind the behind behind the uh, behind the scenes. Y'all yeah. are in the front now. <laughs> y'all are in the front. Y'all are getting the backlash just like everybody else. 
Um, and you know, it's, it's, it's a fun time to watch kind of you and all y'all reporters kind of navigate the space of, uh, people that have good opinions, people that have terrible opinions and navigate social media. Um, you know, me asking him about how he's kind of navigating, cause I'm sure there's not a class on how to deal with the, a superstar or a, uh, notable athlete <laughs> that you're going to cover. No. Um, so it's kind of interesting seeing how y'all have to navigate this whole space where you're trying to tiptoe the line of, I got to ask you these hard hitting questions, but I still got to make sure that we keep this relationship intact. Cause I'm going to have to see you tomorrow. <laughs> and I'm going to have to ask you another question <laughs> probably next week. You know what I mean? Yeah. So um, it's, it's very interesting how y'all are navigating this space. Cause I, I think this is, new to everyone involved i mean you can tell the WNBA; it's new for them the, all the eyes uh I, it's new for y'all and i'm sure we know that it's new to the other group the terrible group you know <laughs> the racism misogyny group uh that you know they're, like, they're enjoying their side of that as well so yeah this, this is this is all just a it's a big experiment oh, we're seeing it happen in real time so yeah, a lot, yeah new, a lot of new experiences and a, and a new uh, NBA champion as well has been crowned. Boston Celtics defeat the Dallas Mavericks in five games. That's all it took. Um, I thought it was going to go at least six. But, man, from the first game, it was just like, man, this team is really good. <laughs> like, the Boston team, like, everyone's talking about how they had no road, which they didn't. Like, the, the road was easy. It was mm-hmm. like flowers and, and lilies all, all on their road to the NBA finals, you know. Every superstar got hurt, the team that they played. So you can't knock them, but it's not like you can't acknowledge it either. And so True. once you get to the finals, it's like, all right, here we go. They actually got a legit competitor, two superstars and Luca and Kyrie, who looked unstoppable heading into the finals. And, you know, the whole question was, how do they guard these two? How do they slow down Luca and Kyrie? And they answered that question really quick. Did they answer it really quick? <laughs> <laughs> they answered it really quick. It's like, oh, we'll just, we'll just guard them. Like, yeah. what are you talking, we'll just guard him. What are you talking about? Right. We'll put Jalen Brown on him and we'll put Drew Holiday on him. And yep, worked we out saw, pretty well. Yeah, we saw <laughs> a completely different Dallas team. Um, I mean, this was not the finals I don't think anybody was expecting or wanted to see. Um, but after the first game, you kind of realize that, you know, there's levels to being in the finals. There's yeah. the Celtics and the Mavericks are a good team. Um, but you can tell that hey, there's, again, there's levels. There's they were outmatched in most of their positions, bench, bench included. Um, so this is kind of the, what you saw. I mean, the Celtics were going to have a Celtics game with uh, what is it, game three uh, or game four? You know, getting I don't even know how that's the same. They got team. up by nearly fifty, bro. <laughs> <laughs> got up by but that was the whole situation, though. Right? The whole conversation was, all right, bet they may have figured out something. I mean, it's one thing to beat a team when you're about to lose. Like, season's over. We get it. You got to win game four. You don't want to get swept. There's a lot of emotions. But it's one way to just win a game, which you need to win to not end your season. It's another thing to beat the crap out of somebody yeah. by nearly 50. Well, you're up by nearly 50. You beat them by nearly 40. And maybe that conversation was valid. Like, maybe they did figure out something. Because no one just gets up by 50 in the yeah. NBA. Like, it just doesn't happen. And so, yeah, they shut that whole conversation to bed, too, the moment it tipped off in game five. So, yeah, I, I just think they always have that one game. They always have that one game. Every, just... every time. And you're just like, yo, they have that one they, game. either y'all just don't care or y'all just, I don't know, maybe y'all was just like, you know, we're going to take the day off. Uh, y'all can have it. We don't want to beat y'all here. Uh, and I think, you know, I think it was good that they won in Boston. I mean, I don't know all the videos and pictures I've been seeing. I mean, that looked like a vibe in there. Mm-hmm. Um, it, that looked historic. Um, you know, it's funny been seeing the the discourse on on Twitter of how nobody really likes uh, Tatum. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah. nobody likes it. It's funny how you know. It's funny how just in the yeah. It's funny how <laughs> we did it. It's Shut funny up. how it's just funny how you know a couple years ago everybody was on his bandwagon, and just recently like nobody really rides with him. He's like I was telling Corey, once you get the corny label on social media, I mean it, it's hard to get it get it off get that get that label off you. Um, 
it. So he's got the label. Um, you know, they were t- tweeting about he's going to go do the Kobe pick. Um, luckily, I know I he was I... restraining himself. Though, yeah, <laughs> I know he wanted to do that Kobe pick in the locker room so bad, bro. I know he did. But I'm, yeah, I know, I know, I know. I'm hopefully somebody tapped on the side like, yo, bro. Hey, bro, don't do nah, it. Don't do it. Don't, don't do, do it, bro. You, you know what that? You know what that smoke yeah, on yeah, social media? Yeah. Try to take as many pictures with dudes as possible, bro. Like, no, be the loving the... father. Yeah, man. don't that don't do the out there. don't do the Kobe pick. But um, yeah, I just. Yeah, it wasn't entertaining. It wasn't an entertaining finals. Um, I was, you know, I haven't seen that discourse as well. Like the finals has kind of lost its its uh, like vibe to it. You aura. know what I mean? Like they they got yeah. The, I don't want to say aura. That's that's the I mean, that's the new word. You don't like aura, bro? It's I hate social media trends. So <laughs> no, I have, aura was just a regular word. Now everybody's aura this aura that, but. Um, yeah, just don't have the same vibe to it. I mean, you get rid of Martin Jackson, Stan Van Gundy, um, you're getting rid of, uh, you getting rid of Shaq and Charles. Uh, I know they don't usually do the finals, but still it's like, we're just losing, you don't have that same vibe without LeBron and stuff. So, I mean, that's another interesting conversation of like, yeah. what are y'all going to do when, they, when they're gone? Because this finals was not competitive. I mean, last year you had the Nuggets in Miami. I mean, yeah, everyone knew who was going to win that series before yeah, he got tipped off. Um, the Suns and Bucks was okay. I didn't watch yeah. it. Yeah, it, it was okay. It was okay. I mean, but not not to the level of you know us having being spoiled with LeBron and stuff and LeBron for a decade. So I wonder what they're going to do. I mean, it's it's not looking too good for them. I mean, we have a lot of great stars, but I mean, these last couple finals have been trash. So. And I got to get my Luca hate off. Oh, I mean, here he goes. Here he's he just goes. not that guy. I know. <laughs> he's just not that guy. I mean, the ISO ball, the no defense. He's not that guy. I mean, I know y'all trying to compare him to Prime Harden. It's it's levels, man. It's levels. And, I think uh, I think he needed he needed definitely more help. We're not going to ignore the fact that the role players, the role players when they were on the road, they just didn't play well. I mean, even last night watching the game, like. No one could hit a shot. No one could literally hit a wide open three. PJ Washington went cold. DJJ went cold. Only person that was actually solid was Josh Green, which is crazy that he was a guy mm-hmm. that stepped up. Um, but Tim Hardaway Jr. only makes shots when they're up by 40. Like, <laughs> what are we talking about? You know, I, and so I felt bad for Luca. And then his Batman B, he went cold too. Kyrie couldn't hit anything in game five. I don't know what it is about Kyrie in Boston, but no, maybe yeah. they do have a spell on him. Because every time he goes there, he just doesn't yeah, play. Like, I think he's like on 13, on 14 yeah. in Boston, yeah. which is a crazy. I'm like, really? Oh, my God. <laughs> well, I think he stepped oh on a little leprechaun, bro. <laughs> like, this is crazy. But, you know, oh like, Luka, Luka didn't have a lot of help uh, in Boston, in those games in Boston. Uh, but I will say that he does need to take some type of accountability. Like, he didn't shoot well either. Uh, he had a lot of turnovers. And so... I think he averaged five turnovers a game. Look like Kalen Clark. Like, um, and so yeah, you gotta you gotta figure something out with that roster. You gotta get dogs that can play one on one defense um, because they're they were hunting Luke at a whole series, and uh, eventually that gets to him. So I will say he, he did better with the uh, not complaining to refs after game three. He really good. I mean, he didn't complain I- as much. Like he showed who he is, bro. I mean, he can have his moments where he wants, but he loves talking to the refs. He <laughs> loves talking to the fans. I mean, that's just who he is. So I will never believe in him uh, until it happens. Maybe he, maybe a change of scenery. Uh, he's not leaving Dallas, coach. bro. He's not leaving Dallas. I'm just saying, maybe, maybe that's maybe that's what it is. Maybe a change of scenery. Maybe a different coach. But I don't think the isocentric ball of you dribbling the ball for a bunch of you know. 18 seconds, uh, taking fadeaway, tough shots, trying to foul bait, you know, yeah. doing, you're doing that, doing all the bumps and, oh my God, it's a foul, it's a foul. I just, I hate it. I hate to watch it. He's a he's a good player, um, but I just hate to watch it. So I'm glad, I'm glad he didn't win. I hate to see Kyrie didn't, didn't get it because that would have been, I mean, that would have definitely been all loved over. It, Kyrie. That would have been all over the top line. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, NBA got to do something, man. 
They got to do something. All right, so I was in the NBA, and I think this is Adam Silver's. He, he got to figure out how to fix that. Um, because I don't, I don't think the NCAA tournament is gonna fix that. Hey man, Indiana but, Pacers. <laughs> hey, oh, <God. laughs> I saw I used the Anthony Edwards uh, video. <laughs> hey, uh, they they got the we got the NCAA tournament, but they got the NBA title. Like, <laughs> We got KD, but we got Jalen Williams. We got the real chip. We got the real chip. Oh, my God. You're stupid, bro. Yeah, the NBA got some work to do, man. The NBA got a lot of work to do to to fix the product. It's not perfect. Uh, This was a very funny, interesting season. I know I've seen that tweet go around. Yeah, every season's Um, funny in the NBA, though. Yeah, it's (laughs) it's a reality TV show. Straight comedy. Straight comedy. Uh, But there's some work to be done to to get this product better. Um, It's not just... At some key moments, it's missing. It's it's missing it. Um, so I, I can't wait to see is. what they do. I don't know what that's what I'm. Is. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. But they're getting rid of some of the it. I mean, Mark Jackson and Stanley getting that in the finals. Like, come on, bro. Yeah. Doris Burke. Shout out Doris Burke. Shout out Doris. Oh, you know, gotta, gotta gotta give her some love. You know, oh, first brother. woman to to commentate a championship series. Um, and so, oh, yeah, man, I gotta give some respect. And I gotta give respect to the. Future Laker head coach, you know what I'm saying? Like, oh yeah, it's time to time to close the episode. Yeah, time out. to start talking about this whole Jay Reddick. Time situation. to close the episode but, out. Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, what, <laughs> what are your final thoughts, Doc? Uh, final thoughts. Uh, I guess uh, as I just lost a friend, I would say just take social media serious. Uh, I think it kind of just made me realize the importance of social media. Like, when we do leave. Uh, he posted a lot of like inspirational quotes and stuff like that on his uh, Instagram. So just realize that you know when you leave this thing, kind of our social media is going to be uh, that last thing that people have of you. You know, friends or your social media family, your social media friends. That's kind of the last thing that uh, people have of you. So I recommend, and what I want to start doing, just posting more, more of your thoughts, because uh, it's kind of like a diary. Uh, you know what I mean? So I'm probably definitely going to go back to this page and just check out all this stuff uh, consistently. Uh, there's a lot of great stuff on there. Um, but yeah, that's kind of my final thought. What about you? Uh, final thoughts. And thank you for that, Dion. Um, final thoughts. And I, I hate to do this right now, but this is kind of, <laughs> it's been on top of my mind. And maybe it's a hot take or whatever, but I don't really care. This whole Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum discourse, like, I know we joke about Jason Tatum trying to be the next Kobe and was he going to take the picture or not? But I think it's very interesting how they are two young stars who mm-hmm. already are getting paid. Jason's about to get a new contract. Jalen Brown already got that $300 million contract, which looking back, they saw something that we didn't see at the time and he proved why they paying him $300 million. But they're about to be locked in for years to come. So is this a situation are we looking at another Shaq and Kobe tandem a situation where you see a lot of potential they already want to chip they have the experience they've been through the highs and the lows now can they sustain it and can they be friends that's what ruined Shaq and Kobe they didn't want to be friends they both wanted to be alphas but with the discourse even throughout this series Dion with Jason Kidd saying Jalen Brown's the best player on the team, Jalen Brown winning the Eastern Conference MVP. Finals MVP. There wasn't, yeah, and then of course Finals MVP. There was moments where there could have been rifts, right? Mm-hmm. And even on the same team, I forgot who it was that came out and said like, "Yeah, Jalen Brown's the best player on the team." I don't know if that was Derek White or Drew Holiday or Horford. One of them said that after Jason Kidd made that comment. A teammate even said, yeah, Jalen Brown's a dog. Like, <laughs> he's the guy. Jason Tatum still went out there. Game, game five, 31 points, 11 assists, eight rebounds. Like, we talk about Jason Tatum and how he's corny and how, you know, he was, he didn't shoot the ball well. But, man, in a closeout game, that's what we're going to be talking about for years to come. We're not going to be talking about how he didn't shoot well. We're going to talk about how he closed him out with 31, 11, and 8. And then picked up his son afterwards. Like, that's a crazy right. stat line. And he did it throughout the whole series. Like, he played well. He just didn't shoot well. But everything else in his game was phenomenal. 
And so I say all that to say, is there going to be a time where there is a rift? Is there going to be a time where they're not all buddy, buddy? I feel like if there isn't, and I feel like if they're able to keep this whole friendship going, we may be seeing what Shaq and Kobe should have done win four or five chips and we like to joke about Jalen Brown saying that whole thing to Taylor Rooks you know like <laughs> he, got, he, got, he got one more year to win five more yeah. chips he got one <laughs> so, more year to win five chips but he could end up winning five chips if we're being honest if he sticks with Tatum if Brad Stevens continues to make moves like he's done this offseason and they have a core that's unselfish they're going to have to pay Derek White this offseason he'll probably get 100 mil But you already got Drew Holiday. You got Porzingis. Porzingis seems to be happy in Boston. And he's on the decline, if we're being honest. So you're not going to have to pay him another max deal anytime soon. So what are we talking about? Are we really legit looking at a maybe Shaq and Kobe situation? Can they just remain to be friends? That's the question I feel like with Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. Because the Eastern Conference ain't getting much better. There's no one moving over there. There's no rumors going on other than Paul George going to Philly. But that doesn't scare me. Like, when is Embiid or Paul George? That ain't anything in the playoffs. So, I don't know, man. And maybe, like I said, maybe I'm just throwing it out there. Just throw it out there just because of tandem. But they looked legit. And they looked unstoppable out there. Um, and the whole team does. So, what's who am I to say they can't do it again? I don't know that. With Missoula as the head coach, he's a sicko. He's a psychopath. Just found out that he was tore his meniscus in March and he's been coaching with a torn meniscus since March no one's talking about that at all but he's a sicko he didn't probably bring it up at all so yeah man I don't know that, that's just my final thoughts um, Jason Tatum Jalen Brown maybe the next Shaq and Kobe if they can remain to be friends and yeah they gotta they gotta win another one for me to be a believer I'm not gonna lie yeah and I'm not, I'm not saying they are this, that's what I said maybe this maybe. playoff run did not really show me didn't make me a believer you're you're on the right side of luck again like yeah. i say that's like you say it's, it's not their fault that <laughs> seemingly everybody gets hurt when they play job but that was just the the, the hand job would dealt uh, but yeah if, if, if i can see something another one maybe i don't know uh, it's hard to see them repeating um but if i can see them another one get another one soon you know in the next three years um yeah, we can we can definitely have that combo. We can definitely have that combo for sure. I can see it on the horizon, bro. Because the team's great. It's not like they mm-hmm. play phenomenal. The team is great. And the team's not going anywhere. Like Derek White's gonna get his bag. Drew Holiday's are all under contract. Porzingis is under contract. Like the core isn't going anywhere. And mind you, lastly, Peyton Pritchard hitting two half court buzzer beaters in the finals. No one's talking about that. I am interested <laughs> to see if he, gets, if he gets more minutes. I mean, I am interested to see if he nah, gets more I mean, minutes. The team's stacked, so I doubt he does. But he's waiting in the wings. Hauser's waiting in the wings. Like, that's what makes me so confident to say what I just said is because of the team. And I believe in the front office that they're going to make all the right moves for them to continue to have a successful shot. Of winning now will Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum continue to play the way that they're playing that remains to be seen but at least they'll have a shot for sure um, but yeah Peyton Pritchard two half court buzzer beaters that's crazy we're not <laughs> we're talking about the NBA finals and two and one finals is crazy and he doesn't play yeah. that much so like <laughs> that's, it. that's yeah. what I'm saying I'm, ex- I'm, I'm curious to see if you try to work him in to get a little bit more time because I think he's a bucket Oh yeah, ever since the Oregon. So I would love to see him get more, more than just those minutes at the end of the quarter and really blow the team out. So yeah, but yeah, but yeah. as a Laker fan, congrats, congrats, Boston. Eighteen chips, can't defeat it. Even though a lot of those came before nineteen seventy. Uh, not trying to hate, just which is crazy. Just I was out like, facts. <laughs> when they when I saw that, I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> Y'all have been trash. Yeah, yeah, they haven't even 30, aged. 40 years. Half their championships the came before we had integration. So y'all are y'all are riding this 2008 title <laughs> to the to the wheels fall off. Jeez. <laughs> yeah, it's been a minute, dude. It's been a minute. But uh, as always, man, thank you for another episode of the pod. Thank you, James, for hopping on the pod. Um, like, comment, subscribe, and uh, follow James Boyd, man. He knows that he's talking about, and he's he's in the thick of things with everything Kalen Clark. So he will be a great follow if you don't follow him already. But Let's get out of here, Dion. as always. 
Yeah. Yeah.